very good morning to all of you. It is a chilly morning, but we're grateful to be here in God's house. I hope you feel that way. Susan, it's always a pleasure to have you help us, bless us. Uh, we love your skills. We thank you for being a part of our worship today. We're going to get our Nancy back one of these days, but uh, we're always grateful for your blessing. Guys, if you'll be turning your Bibles to Philippians 4.2, um, or you can look up on the screen as always. Also, you can go to Jeremiah uh, 18, put a finger there. Uh, we'll be going there eventually. I want to remind you of the seven realities of, or principles, if you want to, of the experience of God as developed by Henry Blackaby and Claude King. The, the truth of these principles are, are frankly, life-changing for you as a Christian. They will change the way you think and experience your relationship with God. So let's look at them again here. God is always at work around you. God pursues a, a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. God invites you to become involved with Him in His work. God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal Himself, His purposes, and His ways. God's invitation for you to work with Him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires your faith and then your action. Number six is you must make major adjustments in your life to join God in what He is doing. Because He's always at work around you. And number seven, you come to know God by experiences as you obey Him and He accomplishes His work through you. So truth is, a, is the person of Jesus Christ. And truth is, is the third person of the Trinity as God manifests Himself in in, in heaven as God the Father, in flesh as God the Son, and, and then in spirit to live in our hearts and soul uh, of us as who are, are mankind is creation. Because he is going to move us and he's going to direct uh, the authority of God upon the earth. And so God is God the Holy Spirit. He is our one God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But he is one God. God is is, is who created all things, all that there is through Jesus Christ. That God of the universe wants a love relationship with you. That's a huge deal. But I want to I I be honest here. Living in holiness comes with a cost. It means that you're going to be an enemy of Satan. It means that you are going to have a lifetime of being stretched also by God as you experience God. So let me look at, a, at our short verses today. You can look up on the screen or if you've already gotten them uh, already. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. If you don't have that highlighted in your Bible, you really need to do that. And then uh, Philippians 2.13, uh, three verses there. For it is God who is always at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling and disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of the crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Here's a quote from Henry Blackaby. Let me read it to you. God is far more interested in a love relationship with you than he is with what you can do for him. His desire is for you to love him. And he fills you with his presence. He will guide you to do all things. But even, even as you do those things, he will be the one and work through you to accomplish his purposes. He is all you need. The Christ in you is your way. He is your map. When you follow his leadership one day at a time, you will always be right in the middle of God's will for your life. And then, and then I would add to, you, to that, when you are following his leadership, when you're doing those things, you will eventually, 
maybe too frequently, come into a crisis of belief that I told you about last week. And really that's the point where you start questioning whether you are understanding, understanding God correctly. Was that God speaking to you? You're going to ask that question. Was that God speaking to me? And, and, and why would God want me to do that? Then, then you want God to show, show you more to you. So you start doing dumb things like this. And I mean dumb things. That's meaning don't do this. You'll, you'll say something like, God, I'm, I'm putting my fleece out before you. If you want me to do what I think you want me to do, please have someone call me and, and start talking about that issue. Or, God, if you really want me to do that, open up the door and, and shove me through it so I know it's you, God. Question, how many times in the Bible did God allow a fleece to be put out in front of you? Actually, twice, but it's with one person. Only with Gideon. How many times did God speak through a burning bush? One time. How many times did God send an angel to Mary to explain to her that she was going to be the mother of God in the flesh? One time. God speaks to us primarily through the Bible and prayer. But what did Jesus say in John 5? How, how many times did Jesus look and ask God to, to teach him what he wanted to hear? Every day. So God speaks to us through the Bible. He speaks to us through prayer. But he also speaks to us through circumstances and from other people. Just be careful who you're listening to, who you're talking to. Your hairstylist may be a great person, uh, but may not be, ought to be your, your uh, main source. Now Dwight was talking to his hairstylist about information. Look what happened to him. You got to be careful who you're talking to. <coughs> The key to all of this is, is what I told you last week, and it's very simple. Listen, surrender all you have to God and release yourself to God for Him to do whatever it is that God wants to do through your life. Once you do that, then say to God you, that you are willing to follow Him wherever it is that He tells you to go. And that you will do whatever it is that God says he wants you to do. Now, what I've just told you will be life-changing. But when that happens, when you say that, a crisis of belief will happen. Your fear will set in, and Satan will try to make you think that God wants to send you to be a missionary in North Korea. And that God is going to do all kinds of things to make your life weird. Because that's what Satan does. Because once you have said those, those phrases, there's no going back. And that frightens Satan all pieces. There's no going back. Because once you release yourself to God, you have just opened up an incredible channel of communication and love and agreement between you and God. And you'll never be the same again. You honestly will begin a different phase of your love relationship with God that moves you forward in your lifestyle of holiness, which quite frankly is going to be a higher level of obedience to be expected of you. Church family, surely you know how much I love you. And I wish I could just coddle you and just teach you all these little wonderful things and and that you're happy uh, about the, these little wonderful sermons I give. But that's not fair to you. If I don't encourage you to step into this love relationship with God, to let go of the things that are in the past, you won't ever have the courage to do it later. You need to do it now. And we need to do it together, frankly, as a church. But since church is made up of individuals, We've got to make it on a personal level first. Look at Jeremiah 18. Maybe this will help explain. Let me flip over there with you. Jeremiah 18. That's going to be between Isaiah and Ezekiel. If you're turning there. 
but because of time, I'm going to go ahead and read 18, 1 through 6. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I shall announce my words to you. Now, notice that, that God did pour out to Jeremiah all that he wanted Jeremiah to do. What did he ask Jeremiah to go do something? And when Jeremiah obeyed and went there, then God was going to reveal the next step. Okay? That's the way God works. Then, in verse 3, I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. There are many references to this same thing in Isaiah, which you know very well. One of them, uh, Isaiah 64, 8, we made a song, a famous song out of it, that we are the clay. Thou art the potter, we are the clay. Yeah. We're, which means that we're not on the same level as the potter, right? We're the clay. If we are imperfect, then the potter is always working with us to make us more perfect and more useful in his hands. Now, Americans don't typically like the term servant. But when we do these things, we become a servant to God. A servant is, who is not moldable and teachable is only fit to be used in the garden. But a servant who wants to learn and to be more useful for their Lord is a servant who the Lord can use to bring to a higher rank and to use them to accomplish more and more. The truth is, God is going to use to use this useful, obedient servant to accomplish his will. Would you like to be that servant? Because God is going to use his servants to accomplish his will. Do you want to be in that? Just like God brought Esther to be used uh, for such a time as, as she was needed to step up and ask for the Jews to be saved. Our task may not be that dramatic, but it, it, frankly, it might even depend on who God is sending us to. Surely you've heard this sermon illustration before. A little boy throwing starfish back into the ocean. Apparently, uh, a colony of starfish got caught in an ocean wave. and got A large number of them got thrown up onto the beach. And this little boy was busily picking up uh, the starfish and throwing them back into the sea. When a man walked up to him and said, Little boy, surely you don't expect to throw all of these starfish back. What possible difference could your efforts make? The little boy looked up at the man and, and picked up another starfish and threw the starfish back into the ocean. Looked back up at the man and said, Well, it made a difference to that one. And then he picked up another starfish and threw it back into the ocean. Here's the gotcha to all of this. You listening? What you do next shows what you believe about God. After all of these things, after you ask God to do all of this, and let me, God, do this, and God presents you with, a, with, a, with an opportunity, what you do next shows what you believe about God. Maybe a little tough to hear that, but it's true. The question is, do we trust God enough to let him be in charge of our lives? That's what the question is. Do we trust him enough to let him be in charge of our lives? Because when you do that, then you're going to start being prompted to do things. You'll feel this, this strong impulse to pray for certain people. I've asked you about that before. If you feel a strong urge to pray for somebody, stop and pray for them. That's God giving you an opportunity to help them. And you'll feel uh, prompted to do something kind 
Probably for, for somebody that you don't even like. Because God wants to see your level of obedience. You'll feel compelled to speak up and, and to show concern and compassion in situations that you never thought you would even care about. But now all of a sudden you do. Last night when I heard that the last of the hostages were freed, I just, all I could do is keep from weeping. Just, I was always really at the point where my voice was catching. It just thrilled me so much. Just four people, but God protected them. And it was thrilling to me. That's what God does in your life when you let him. All of a sudden, you'll have interest in new things. And you'll want to do a new work because you feel compelled to do that new work. Now, warning, it, rarely will you hear a voice, but you think you do. You think you heard a voice. Virtually never will you be hit with a message from God like a bolt of lightning. But it happens. It's happened to me. But most of the time, the voice of God is in the Bible. And as you read the Bible, this new understanding will just leap out to you. And, and when that new understanding or that new thought leaps out to you, my strong advice to you is stop reading. Focus on what you just heard. Focus on that thought. You might even go back, if you have a study Bible, go back and, and look up that word and, and then follow it where, where it goes through the other parts of the Bible. And, and, and you'll begin to wonder, why has that thought come to me? And, and, and what do I do with it? And, and why is that thought troubling me so much? Why can't I think of something else? Because this thought keeps coming back to me. That's a red flag, folks. That God is up to something. And he wants to do a work through you. When you are hearing those thoughts, congratulations. Because the Holy Spirit of God is talking to you. The Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you for the Father. And you're hearing and you're understanding and you're feeling and, 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 you're, and you're being compelled in, in these new ways by the hand of God through the Holy Spirit of God to understand these new pursuits that God wants you to learn, to perform for Him or to use your skill set to accomplish a work for him. Remember our saying, Sandy? God will do all of this for his glory and for our good. So ask God for wisdom. Ask him for discernment. Ask him to clarify his will to you so that it will be more clear. Now, you're not going to get sky riding in the clouds saying this is God's will for your life. You're not going to get this big announcement from heaven. You're going to have to know it in your heart through the experience that you have with God. You become more and more familiar. Here's more truth that I need, that I need you to understand. You ready? God is sovereign. God is in control. And God's timing may not be our timing. But it's always right, and it's always on time, but it's on his time. You'll, you'll hopefully remember that last October, a few of our friends from college came and, 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 and visited with us here and was at church with us here. One of them was June. She sat right down here where Paul Norman sits and Sharon, she, he, she and uh, her husband uh, sat right there. But the night before, what you didn't know is she had come from MD Anderson. She drove all the way through a wreck downtown to Houston, all the way here. They got here around 2.30 or 3, went to bed, got up, came in with us here at church. Now, she was small frame, if you remember her. June had pancreatic cancer. Now, one time, and all of the time that we were together, about three hours, despite her being in that, in that, in that uh, treatment the day before, she stayed awake. She didn't complain, I'm tired, I need to go. She never said anything. And when we talked about her cancer, she never said, you know guys, I just can't believe that God gave me this cancer. First of all, it, it's highly unlikely that God would give her that cancer. But did he allow it? 
Yeah, yeah. For whatever reason that her body developed this pancreatic cancer, she did not blame God. She, but she said, I wanted to be the best I could be for him in the time that I have left. That was her goal. She was buried this last weekend with no regrets for being the best servant of God that she could be while she could for God. God is sovereign and he is in control and he knows exactly what he wants and he knows what is best and he knows what is good for you because he has plans for you. And I've said this over and over. God will not throw a brick through your window to see how you're going to react. But he may allow you to go through circumstances in order to grow you. Or especially if you have created those circumstances. Because God wants you to be more moldable. And he wants to bring you further along on the journey with him. Now, admittedly, none of those experiences are usually fun. But unfortunately, they are necessary to rub off the, the burrs of our life. Have you ever watched a person making a key, Dwight? You know, he gets that key, he takes your key, he takes that blank, he puts it in the machine, and you know, he starts making that really high-pitched sound and, and grinding out that, and, and then he, he takes the key, and many times there's a little slot there, and he slides it back and forth in that key. And if he's really good at his job, he'll look at that key, and he may even take a steel brush and rub it a little bit more. You know what he's doing? After that machine has cut off that, it leaves little burrs. So he's trying to get those burrs off so that the key will fit into the lock that you have it set for so that it will do its job and do what it's supposed to and open the door. That's us. That's us because God sometimes has to shave off some rough spots in our life to get us to the place where he wants us to be so that he can use us the way he wants to use us. However, I'm just going to tell you, if you resist him and you pursue your own uh, agenda instead of his or in addition to his, then probably he's going to have to shave off some burrs in your life so that he can use you correctly and mold you correctly into the image of Christ that God wants you to be. God loves you. Remember that. God loves you. He has created you to have a love relationship with him that is real and personal. But it requires us to release ourselves to him and to literally surrender all that we have, all that we are to him. For him, for God to mold us into the image of Christ that God wants us to be. You with me on this? Well, y'all look stunned. It's a lot, isn't it? But if you're really going to step into this relationship and you're really going to say, God, I want to be what you want me to be, what I've shared with you today is the truth. Bow with me. Heavenly Father, following you and being an, an obedient servant of yours is not always easy. People in China are having their homes taken away from them and destroyed. People in China are, are, are going to jail, to prison, to work camps because they believe in you. And yet they keep serving you. People in, in places where Christianity is basically illegal love you. And, and, and here we are in America. And... and and, and because, frankly, because of our freedom, we shrink back from having to do more work. And be under the microscope that you put us under when we give all of ourselves to you. It, it's hard. But Father, when we do, it's a whole new relationship. It's a whole new level of, of, of being in your presence. It's a whole new area of life that gets resolved.
So we, we just want to say thank you, God, for hearing us. Thank you, God, for working with us. And individually, we need to make these steps, but as a church, we need to also step forward and embrace you in a deeper way. We love you. Help us to love others. Be what you want us to be. This we pray in Christ's name.